Welcome back to This is Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. With me today, I have Professor David Awurawu, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos, and Okpayemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Officina. Now, to our next subject, Rwanda is commemorating today the 30th year after genocide, during which 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed within a 100-day period. Various legal provisions have been implemented over the years to assist the survivors of the violence. However, for one young Rwandan making peace with the past, means unraveling the mystery of his identity. He doesn't know his birthday or the whereabouts of his family. He's among potentially dozens or hundreds of young Rwandans who were discovered by soldiers in 1994, left among the bodies of their deceased relatives during the genocide. These infants were relocated to orphanages and later placed in foster families. But 30 years on, they grapple with their identity. For us, we were a, ch a child, a baby. We could not manage to remember what was happening. Just what we know is what we, we founded in the orphans where we were. Because those soldiers who brought us from dead bodies taken to orphans, before you, they receive you, they recorded. So that is where I founded it as personally my story, that I have been in the dead bodies and the soldiers took me to orphans. First of all, I feel very weak and very uncomfortable without confidence because everywhere I go, they told me you are Hutu, you are sons to Inera Hamni. So I was very unconfident and very uncomfortable. Most of the time I chose to be alone to stay inside the, the house, my room, not going in publicly. Yes, as a people who believe in God, maybe the miracle, miracle will be happen. But by now when I'm looking far, for me to find the way, I don't have hope for having a better life because now I'm, maybe I'm 30 years old, above 30. I could get, go out and walking and looking for life just to prepare my, my future. But now, as you find me, you find me inside of my house. Even to get me, I was not trusting you. So trusting everyone in the road, it was very difficult for me. That is why I don't have any hope of my future. I'm now being joined by a seasoned diplomat and one-time Nigerian Minister of External Affairs, Professor Bolaji Akiyemi, to revisit this very profound period in African history, whether or not lessons have been learned and how that piece of history has shaped Africa's relationship with the rest of the world in the intervening period. Good to see you, Prof, on this day live the Sunday talk show. Well, Prof. Good evening. Thank, thank you, Prof, for joining me on this program. Not on the morning show. <laughs> but this is, this is a live. <laughs> but, <laughs> but all, the, the, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but this is... I uh, know you will pull my leg. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this is the day. It's a very sad day. 30 years after, the yeah. Rwandans, they had genocide for 100 days. Over 800 persons were killed. Clearly, an issue about ethnic conflicts, ethnic differentiation. What lessons can we learn from Rwanda? Apart from Nigerian leaders going there, and visiting the, uh, uh, the memorial sites and all of that. What specific lessons can Nigerians and indeed the rest of the world learn about ethnic hate, 
ethnic politics, genocide. Well, um, the, having seen what's happening in Gaza, I'm not sure it would be an act of wisdom for one to say we've learned any lesson from the Kigali genocide. First of all, we don't even know the truth about that Rwandan genocide. We don't know the truth. A lot of events have been buried um, over that issue. Uh, I'm persuaded in my mind that there are foreign hands that were embed, embedded in the genocide there. I'm absolutely convinced. You see, if you say democracy is a game of numbers, then please explain to me uh, or explain to the world how minority Tutsis will be ruling majority Hutus. Explain to me, unless somebody has engineered it. Number two, what actually triggered all that genocide was the shooting down of the plane carrying the Hutu president and his colleague from uh, Burundi. They were shot. As the plane was about to land, they were shot down. Um, who has the capacity and the technological ability to bring down a plane using um, um, using the technical know-how the, the, that can bring down that plane just as it was descending. Who has that capability? Several, several. Uh, uh, Theories had been, had been brought up, um, and it's no use, especially since I don't have access to intelligence uh, papers. I don't have access to intelligence papers. I cannot say it is this or it is that. I know that the present president of Rwanda had accused one of the foreign Western governments of having a hand in what happened. Don't forget that the United Nations troops were there. What were they doing? It, uh, the, the United Nations troops were uh, were led by a Canadian general. He had said certain things which some people have found uncomfortable in terms of the instructions that he was given. I mean, frankly, to tell the truth, if you were to be um, uh, a general, under United Nations command, I wouldn't accept that command because you will be controlled from New York with all the politics that goes on in the headquarters there. And you will not be allowed to perform your job the way it should be performed. Oh, okay. so we don't really know 
Sorry? Prof, no, I was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I was going to say that, Prof, you are yeah. going along the lines of uh, conspiracy theory that Abiyarim yes. uh, Mana, I think that's the name, Abiyarim Mana, you know, who was president in 1994 because he was Houthi. Utu mm -hmm. was brought down by the minority Tutsis. Mm -hmm. Are you are saying that there was also international yes. conspiracy involving it. The international conspiracy will be speaking yes. to the role of Belgium and I think uh, Germany in the matter. Are you saying that that conspiracy and perhaps, theory... Perhaps, and perhaps, yeah. Yeah, are you saying that that... And perhaps France... Yeah, are you saying that that conspiracy theory is a valid way to look at the Rwandan genocide? I'd ask you about the lessons that Nigeria can learn because the uh, Rwandans, they moved ahead. They said, oh, nobody should be identified again along ethnic grounds. Uh, they made that an exclusion clause in their constitution and all of that. I wanted you to speak to yeah. oh, what can we learn not this blaming of the outsider, Belgium, uh, Germany, France, because we cannot properly, with due respect, establish the role that they played. Quite true, quite true. You are quite correct. But you see, un unless you look at the foundation, you cannot guarantee that the building will stand erect. But I will concede to you that I should move on. What can Nigeria learn from this? The first lesson we should learn from it is that there is a danger when groups don't get along together or when groups don't manage their conflicts within uh, I mean who was it who was the Nigerian I think it was Wale Shonyekra who wrote something about the road to Kigali because he saw the way we were going that we've got to We've got to be able to manage our conflicts within parameters that are acceptable. Now, the question you want to ask is, are we managing our conflicts along parameters that are acceptable? Are we indeed? Now... You have Boko Haram uh, 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 doing their own thing in the in the northeast. You have uh, in the northwest um, farmers, you know, uh, uh, people who are kidnapping. You have that going in the southeast. You have for years conflicts that are unmanageable between the people there and uh, the, the, the military. And it has spread to the Southwest, frankly. So are we managing our conflicts within parameters that we should be? And um, to me, the answer is no, we are not. Are we learning a lesson from Kigali? And the answer again is no. But be, let us be careful. Let us be careful. The president of Rwanda is a minority. And that's why I started my conversation with you by saying should a minority be ruling a majority? Is that democracy? Is that, would that be acceptable? Um, frankly, you, I mean, you talk about 
been in their constitution that uh, there is no Hutu, there is no Tutsi, everybody is a Rwandese. Is that acceptable to everybody? Has everybody accepted it or has that been rammed down their throat? What you ram down people's throat is not democracy. It simply isn't. And there is no way you can persuade me and persuade most people that a minority will be ruling a majority. It's simply not on. You are doing it by force. Well, Prof, um, I, I will try to uh, make this uh, contemporaneous. As part of the lessons we have learned from uh, Rwanda, are there comments that we can make about the current situation between Israel and Hamas, particularly with the situation in Gaza? Humanitarian aid was a big issue in 1994 in uh, Rwanda. Will you say that the world geopolitics is back to the same spot? And will you say that the international community is playing the right kind of role beyond uh, uh, President Biden uh, making uh, rhetorical statements about the responsibility of the United States and the United Nations Security Council proven so ineffectual, even the ICJ being incapacitated in terms of his uh, ability to enforce his own rulings. Do you know that the Gaza, uh, the, 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 the Gaza, if, uh, now what do we call it? Genocide. I have had uh, important people, educated people, now call it genocide. I have listened to the International Court of Justice. Their very first ruling, they backed off from using the term genocide. But since then, they have given a second ruling, and that second ruling had actually, I would say, 99.9% .9 come close to genocide. So what lesson have we then learned from Kigali? What is happening in Gaza is worse than what, is, than what happened in Kigali. The United, as so rightly said, the United Nations Security Council is paralyzed. And we know why it is paralyzed. The veto cast constantly by the United States, and cast in whose favor? Cast in the Israeli favor. What Israel has done in Gaza, honestly, is unacceptable. Now, let's make this clear. And you know, I've appeared before you before. So let's make this clear. Um, what happened... Uh, by the Hamas also is unacceptable. Unacceptable. So, but as the, even the International Court of Justice said in part of the paragraphs of what he said, that Two genocides don't make a right. Two, you know, two, two, two things that, you know, makes our minds, you know, shake. Do not make a right. But again, let us go back. To, we, we must always go back to 1948. The, secure, I mean, the Secretary General of the United Nations stuck out his neck and said this problem 
did not start with what Hamas did. He said so. And the Israeli ambassador was so infuriated that he called for his resignation. But the fact is, 1948 was when the United Nations divided Palestine into two. Israel having one side and the Palestinians having the other side. But because of a series of wars, Israel had continued to accumulate the land of the Palestinians. Force doesn't make things right. It doesn't. And therefore, the world has got to go back to these two-stage states, whereby Israel is a state and the Palestinians form another state and they live side by side. That is the solution. It, it, genocide is not the solution to what is happening in Gaza. It's impossible. Okay, sir. I, I, I asked you that question because of this next one. About two hours ago, the president of uh, Rwanda said that the international community failed Rwanda in 1994. That was his uh, big statement. That if the international community, the United Nations Security Council, the African Union had acted differently, Maybe we will not have had uh, that genocide. Now, do you agree with him? And do you think that the international community is still failing the people under the principles of uh, all those mechanisms that came up, 1945 to 1949, United Nations, this and that? Do you think that what we are facing really today is a failure of the international system? Yes, what we have, what we faced in Kigali, as well as Gaza, is a failure of the international community, as well as um, what, what, what is the term now that you know we have to use? People have simply not been honest with themselves. They have not been honest with international law, international humanitarian law. Each country has turned inward and allowed internal politics to dictate what position they will take, whether in Kigali, or in Gaza. That is the thing. However, Dr. Abati, let us be clear about this. We are human beings. We are not angels. And because we are human beings, we are not going to be doing the right things at the right time. You know very well, as I do, that in the case of Kigali, um, um, yeah, the United Nations Secretary General um, did not issue the instructions he was supposed to issue to the Canadian troops that were there. The same thing with the French troops that were there. The Under Secretary General, who was in charge of peacekeeping operations, was our man, the Ghanaian, who later on became the Secretary General, and he himself said he regretted the action that he took. You know, the, the, the especially uh, international civil servants, 
don't do the correct thing. They allow their actions to be dictated by the position they are holding and the position they want to continue to hold at the United Nations. Now, in the case of Gaza, this, I mean, frankly, um, we've gone beyond, well, uh, what do you want to call it? Every, almost, from the Secretary General himself, every single, every single United Nations operative had condemned Israel. They have been ready to, fall, to lose their job. And the reason being that for the first time in the history of the United Nations, so many United Nations officials, their families have been killed in this process. You will recall that I appeared before you in January. And I your wished me Happy New Year, and I rejected it. Because journalists, doctors, United Nations officials, people who were just doing their job, they had no dogs in the fight. They, 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 they had no vested interest in what was happening between the Israelis and Hamas. They just wanted to protect the innocent, feed the, the hungry, take care of people in the hospitals, and the Israelis were bombing them. They were targeting them. And you know what happened last week? When, uh, is it seven? Seven people who were there simply to take care of the of, of, of people who were hungry were deliberately targeted by Israel. And this was so annoying, it was so provocative that several countries were now calling that they would weapons to Israel. You know it. It even led to something which has never happened before in the history of, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom when three or so Supreme Court judges joined other eminent lawyers in signing, in signing a petition to the president to, to, to the prime minister of Britain that Britain should not supply weapons to uh, um, to Israel and of course in the case of the United States streets are filled well, with demonstrations well, well, prof. telling the, 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 the telling you know Biden that you know he's crossed the red line. What okay, more evidence prof, do prof, you want? Prof, there are other issues related to Rwanda. After all, in the UK, they have issues about whether or not uh, all those boat migrants should be sent to uh, Rwanda. They are looking at the law with the European Court, with the Save uh, Rwanda Migrants uh, Bill. But those are the details that are in the pot. But by way of summary, we started with what lessons can we learn? What lessons can Nigeria learn in terms of ethnic aid? In terms of uh, some Nigerians even say Nigeria there's uh, genocide and about nationalism and how we protect Nigeria. If we can just round up on, the, on those issues. Well, I believe Nigerians should learn to live together. We are too big to disintegrate. The consequences of Nigeria falling apart is we can't, we should not even be considering it. 
because having seen what had happened in um having seen what had happened in um uh, Kigali uh I mean to tell you the truth God do you you know no we've gone through a civil war in Nigeria I don't know how many millions died okay I don't know how many millions died. We've gone through a civil war in Nigeria. And do you want a second civil war? A, a, an eminent general, say why that Juma, said no country survives a civil war. Uh, to, uh, another civil war. And here we are. We are, we are now talking about I say we have not served a second. I mean, I say we have not gone through a civil war. So, I, I mean, the short answer to your question is, let us stop this hatred in this country. Let us stop this. I mean, let us accept results of elections. Because there, in four years' time, there will be another election. In four years' time, another group may come in. But you know this situation where we refuse to accept the result of an election and we continue hatred amongst us, it's not going to lead us to any good. On that note, Prof, on that note, Prof, I would like to thank you very much for joining us on Dizzy Live, the Sunday talk show.